at this inflection point of existential change, there are dueling forces at play. While Justice Ginsburg's legacy continues to provide us a way to address inequality and stereotypes, her legacy itself is at stake. Kimberly Crenshaw, 30 years ago, gave us a lexicon to speak on intersections of race, gender, and class. And in 2020, Isabel Wilkerson provides us with a new language to speak of modern day bias protocols, caste protocols, as she calls it. But the inclusion discourse itself is now under threat. The dual forces of COVID and a mass public reckoning on race have revealed new inequalities, but yet the gains made in the last decade on inclusion are likely to be reversed and rolled back. The social justice movements on Black Lives Matter and Me Too have gone global, but a backlash based on unilateralism and tribalism is fast brewing around the world. If ever there was a time for leadership, it is now. So where do we look for leadership? That too has changed. 70% of the top 100 revenue generating entities in the world are not nations, but corporations. They have the responsibility, the resources, and the implicit permission to be courageous on social issues and affect real change. And that is why the business leaders that we bring here together hold the potential to be the agents of change. And this forum finds its deepest expression in Timothy Wilkins's recent writings, which he shared with me in the summer, which he calls business as unusual, where he speaks of the power of people, the power of the purse and the power of the pulpit of businesses to create this triangulating force for the good. But, I, but as I've told Timothy before, I'd like to add, add a fourth element to, the, to, to, to this triangulating forces, and that is the power of purpose that businesses have now embraced. So two, I want to share two quotes with you in order to frame this discussion. The UN Secretary General told a group of business leaders in 2019, let me start by a brutal sentence. Either the sustainable development goals are fully assumed with enlightened self-interest by the business community and the private sector, or the sustainable development goals will be just a nice exercise in diplomatic discussions in New York and have no impact on the planet. Along with the Secretary General's words, BlackRock's CEO Larry Fink has said, stakeholders are pushing companies to wade into sensitive social and political issues, especially because they see their governments failing to do so effectively. And he has said very strongly, stakeholders are demanding that companies exercise leadership on a broad range of issues including the environment and social and good governance, which are increasingly integrated into our investment portfolios. But I also want to raise some existing paradoxes that create a gap between the principle and the purpose on the one hand and practice on the other. So despite expansive commitments, several companies have come under attack for continuing internal policies and business practices that continue to perpetuate the status quo. So in your study, Timothy, you mentioned Daryl Walker, the, CEO, the president of Ford Foundation, but he did fund a study to look at some of the commitments that were made soon after the 2019 Business Roundtable's influential commitment to what was called purpose-driven business. And this recent study found, and the name of the study is the test of corporate purpose, that the signatories to the new corporate purpose pledges have done no better than other companies while failing to distinguish themselves in pursuit of racial and gender equality. 
So companies have pledged money, but the culture hasn't changed and systemic change has not followed. So with that, I want to ask you, Timothy, in terms of two questions. So one is the question that your brother, David Wilkins, um, uh, shared with us back in 1993 when he wrote this path-breaking law review article, Two Paths to the Mountaintop, the role of legal education in shaping the values of black corporate lawyers. And he spoke about the obligation thesis that law schools and corporations have in advancing black leaders in corporate America. So that is, I think, one of the most important ways in which Daryl Walker says, throw out the old playbook and seize a new playbook. And I think that's consistent with what David Wilkins has called upon corporate America and leading legal education institutions to seize this moment. In 2004, there was a call to action by the general counsels of Fortune 500 corporations. And the general counsels pledged that teams, that their legal firms would be more diverse and that they would not hire law firms that were not diverse. And the same year, a couple of years later, once again, David Wilkins wrote this groundbreaking article where he examined what he calls the action after the call. And he found that despite this call to action for diversity and inclusion, little had changed in fundamental terms. So I want all of you to to think that you're looking back 20 years from now in 2040 at this moment in history and how will history judge us? How will history judge the way in which those pledges and promises that corporations have made for a more sustainable and more inclusive future have those promises being met? And what more must be done to advance ESG or the environment, social and governance that remains the bedrock of inclusion and sustainability and diversity. So Timothy, can you, can you, answer, can you respond to that question? And then I'm going to ask the same question from all of my distinguished panelists. Terrific. Thank you, Rangita. And I love joining a panel where my brother gets so many great shout outs. So this is fantastic. Um, Rangita might have mentioned that uh, my brother and I actually did a webinar for the first time together in which we were grappling with this issue around issues of race, this moment, but also sustainability. So um, Rangita, my um, title at the firm is I'm the global partner on client sustainability. And to me, the answer of what that future is going to look like goes back in many ways to how we're advising clients right now on sustainability. Sustainability has moved from that sort of fringe activity, just like diversity and inclusion was kind of, oh, we have a diversity officer off to the side of the company who may be doing things, or we have somebody who's checking our paper, uh, printing content and all that. But now sustainability is right in the core of um, the way that we're advising clients. And I think that the real progress, you mentioned the four Ps that I've talked about, that there's real power in the purse, money, people, pulpit, how you're using platforms to advocate for racial justice, but also there's the P of practice, of how does a business in their daily operations work? And I think if you apply a sustainability lens, there's three major new innovations that are coming up in sustainability that will help on the social justice front. 
first of all, sustainable finance. So you mentioned Larry Fink. Um, I like to refer to him as the $15 trillion elephant in the room. Um, he has made those pronouncements. Companies have listened. Why is it so important to him? Well, he's seen what's happened, that sustainable companies are doing well. And during the pandemic, they were actually doing even better than other companies because they had created supply chains that were more stable. They had stable workforces. They had consumer loyalty. Um, so the finance issue, knowing that the money out there is important, but now let's think about instruments that can be used. So Alphabet, Google's parent, issued a $5.7 billion sustainability bond in which that they're dedicating raising funds. And by the way, there was absolute investor appetite for this bond raising money to do sustainable activities. And I was really impressed to see $175 million of that bond was gonna be dedicated to racial and social justice activities like building up businesses so that there's a real transfer of equity and wealth in the business community. So that's sustainable finance. Um, and, and by the way, there'll be new and more creative products like sustainability linked loans, where you can actually move the interest rate up and down based on hitting sustainability targets for example, around social justice issues or other impact issues, because lenders appreciate that sustainable companies are better credits even. So that's one. So then the other one would be around antitrust. So antitrust isn't something you typically think about as being important for sustainability and social justice, but the truth is collaboration is the only way we're gonna meet those big challenges, Rangita, that you set out. And when we think about collaborating, typically when companies, especially in the same industry, get together and say, you know what, we've got to get rid of single use plastics, we need a new packaging, it might cost an extra nickel per package, but that's okay, it's for the public good. Well, regulators saying, hold on, our job has always been to um, help consumers. And so you're talking about raising the price of consumers. But is that really what the regulator's job is? The regulator's job in protecting consumers or the public good should be encouraging certain types of collaboration. So there's gonna be a lot of interesting discussions on the legal front to get that right in regulation. And then I'll just end with one more point, and that is on the corporate governance side. In order for there to be real sustainable change, what you're looking for 20 years from now, we're going to have to have much more transparency about what these companies are doing. And right now, as many people know, there are all these different forms about what is appropriate reporting. Just recently, the accounting firms all got together at the UN and they waved their flag and said, no, we're gonna come up with our own standard, which by the way, which will require you to hire accountants to check on their standards, but that's okay if it's something that's universal and people are doing. But um, that transparency about how activities, how we can measure the progress, certainly we've seen it on the carbon footprints, but we're going to see this across other social justice issues as well. So just concluding sustainable finance, antitrust type measures, corporate governance, these will move the boundaries um, hopefully in a very substantial way, using a sustainability lens on the issues you've described. Thank you, Timothy, for that very concrete and panoramic overview of ESG. And I wanted to wait till the end to introduce all of you because we also have your bios online. So I'm not going to waste time waiting in on your distinguished careers but your comment on the importance of measuring success and measuring sustainability effects um, really drive me to Silda. And Silda Spitzer is the former first lady of New York and is such a dear friend because the way in which you have that kind of ineffable quality to inspire my students, Silda, and I've often told you that of all of the 50 women leaders that my class last year met, there was one woman leader 
that really held their imagination and that was you, Silda. So I wanted to acknowledge that at the outset and you are much more than the former first lady of New York. You're a lawyer, you're an entrepreneur. You are currently the CEO of New York Makers. You run a woman owned private equity firm and your most recent Harvard Business Review post speaks to the, the importance of metrics and measurement that Timothy just spoke of and that the board needs to be charged with the responsibility of measuring ESG. If not, it will be just in the realm of rhetoric. It will be one of those fashionable uh, lingua franca, the kind of, you know, every, every generation has a vernacular that becomes very fashionable. But if it's really going to mean something, it needs to be measured. So can you tell us a little bit about ESG and how important that measuring that is for corporate performance? Sorry for my technical difficulties there. <laughs> I lost the whole screen. Thank you so much for having me, Rangita, and saying those lovely things. I, I thoroughly enjoyed meeting with your students and, and they are the inspiration for us all. But um, happy to be here today and share the, the screen with uh, Timothy and, and Andrew and uh, just all, all of the folks who are participating participating in this conference. Um, I, I heartily support Tim's three points. I think uh, in, in looking at the ESG uh, metrics piece, I think this is taking the uh, environmental, social governance policies and practices of companies and putting them into uh, standards of measurement. I think one of the challenges for this, I think most everyone agrees we need to have measures so that we can compare companies within industries, uh, best practices. Uh, it has been a challenge to try to get to uh, these common measurement standards. Um, I do think we are at the point that we have enough. Uh, there are different standards, but they're overlap. And I think that there is convergence around some of enough of the metrics to be able to compare companies within industries and set standards. Uh, so I think that work needs to continue. Uh, I think that um, it is a challenge to get the companies uh, to participate perhaps in reaching uh, the, the transparency levels and the commonality and metrics that we would like to see and we know we need to find. But I do think that uh, the collective force of the investment community, uh, the growing awareness by um, those who are, uh, aggregating and allocating capital uh, in the, uh, the profitability possibilities from doing this, uh, that they can make money on this, uh, is, is going to continue to grow. So I think that uh, we will get there. I just think it's kind of, it's a lot of push me, pull you. And I, and I think that, um, that that it will just be a process. But I think that where we are now uh, is infinitely beyond where we were 10 years ago and certainly is beyond where uh, we were 20 years ago where I think that people would laugh and say, oh, you know, these aren't real metrics. They don't have anything to do with how companies um, are performing should be performing. Uh, but in fact, uh, now we are coming to the point where we are acknowledging that, um, in fact, many of these things, you can put uh, financial and numerical measurements around, uh, as well as embracing the idea that, um, that there are some things that have impact 
uh, that that can be measured even if it's not in a full financial sense. Uh, so I think that where we are going uh, is that ESG is just going to become a part of a good com good company company analytics. So it's just going to become the performance standard uh, for how to be competitive. And I think that um, hopefully we will move to a somewhat longer term lens that we will also be applying uh, that really will get to um, the idea of resilience and uh, that ultimately we're going to have stronger, better, more, um, more returns and better performance from companies that have ESG being evaluated as part of what, they're just better run companies. So uh, the environmental considerations mean that we will have access to uh, resources for longer for the individual companies as well as for society. Uh, from the governance point of view, you're just going to have better perspectives, more perspectives being brought into the boardroom, uh, into the company strategy, decision making, and certainly from a social point of view, considerations of the, the social capital involved and workers uh, attracting talent, retaining talent, uh, conditions under which workers are engaging. And key to the conversation that we're having today, the diversity uh, and inclusion and how important that is. So I think there is, I do think there's just this build, building and building kind of tipping point, which I would argue we've already reached and we're just now kind of pushing it on home. Uh, and underlying all of this, I think is the the concept of risk and reward is really what's driving this. Uh, investors looking at this first, the accounting firms, insurance companies, uh, law firms are gonna be advising their comp the companies that they work with and the, the financing firms that they're working with. These are all, all factors that really go into what are the best places where you can, you know, put your money and we as a society can put our capital? So, Silda, you are reinforcing what Timothy introduced to us, yeah. the fact that companies that have strong ESG metrics are more competitive and perform better. And I think that is now well established. But what but I was also moved by the way in which you said, you know, we have made progress. So yes, we do, we do accept the fact that we have made progress in diversity and inclusion and in sustainability and in meeting the sustainable development goals, although the clock is ticking. But at the same time, I'm aware, and as the Secretary General just said it at the General Assembly, this is our 1945 moment. This is and reminding us the relevance of that Second World War moment, that we are again at a moment of a tipping point, a major existential crisis. So how will future generations judge us? In 55 years time, how will we look back to this 2020 moment? And the fear is that we will we are that there, there is a threat that that progress will be reversed, that the progress that we have made will be rolled back because of COVID and because of a leadership crisis. And I think that's why I'm thrilled to have three ESG leaders and Sunil Gupta, who is not uh, what I would say a traditional ESG leader, but whose work has really helped to revolutionize leadership. Here's a business leader who has run for political office, so who really looks at the convergence of the public life with the enormous power and the potential of the business platform. So you've leveraged the business platform to do good and then use that to run for office and use it as a tool for public good. 
Sunil, you've been an entrepreneur, you've been a venture capitalist, you've been a thought leader and an educator, but your current book, which I think is one of the most important books written on thinking outside of the box, thinking on business, you have said that, um, that there are success stories to be learned from case studies and patterns that you have observed but that you share with us six qualities of backable people, right? Successful entrepreneurs and thinkers who people want to back. And you have really unmasked those six ineffable qualities that people possess in order to be back, to be backed. And so why, you know, people ask, People have always asked me, why is it that I always bring someone who is an outlier and outsider looking in into a panel? Because I think it's important to add that kind of dynamic. You, know, you have three experts on ESG, and I want someone to add that little bit of um, twist to the conversation that provides a cutting edge to our discourse. So Sunil, can you share with us, to those of us who are yet to read Backable, what are those six qualities that make an entrepreneur, especially an entrepreneur who, uh, who is looking to advance inclusion and diversity and sustainability, Backable? Sure, well, I am happy to be the, the, the non-expert on the panel. And, um, and, and to share it with, with such distinguished people. So thanks for having me. You know, um, Rangita, one of the stories that came to mind, and, and I do talk about it in the book as well, um, is about a woman named Damienti Hingarani. And Damienti um, was one of the inspiring forces for uh, Girls Who Code, uh, which you may, you may know about, which, which uh, gives women all around the world, girls around the world, technology training. It's an amazing, it's an amazing organization. And um, it's, it was started by a woman named Reshma Sujani, but Demethi Hingarani was one of the inspiring forces. And what makes Demethi's story, I think really fascinating is that uh, she was a refugee. She grew up with no running water, no electricity on the border of Pakistan and India. And, um, it, but she did something very remarkable. She, she taught herself how to read. And the first book that she read from cover to cover was the biography of Henry Ford. And after reading this book, I mean, she, she's about nine years old at this point. She reads this book and she decides that, that she wants to become an engineer at Ford Motor Company, which you know, is, a, is a very impossible uh, vision for somebody like that to have because, you know, first of all, you know, they don't have the resources uh, to get her to the United States. Her family is very, very poor. Um, second of all, you know, Ford Motor Company, it was the it company of that time. We're talking about the early, late 50s, early 60s. You know, it was, it was the place where everybody wanted to work. It was the most innovative so company on the planet. Stop. May I ask you to pause for a bit? Sure. Because I read the story about your heroic mother. And your uh -huh. mother was the first woman engineer of Ford. Yes. Well, yes. So uh, you beat me to the punchline, Rangita. So that woman who ended up becoming Ford Motor Company's first female engineer um, was this woman, Demethi Hingarani, uh, and and that is my mom. And and uh, and so when I think about this topic, it's hard for me not to not to think about her. But what was interesting about the moment, Rangita, that that that's behind that moment was that. The, you know, the, the hiring manager, when she finally got in front of a hiring manager at Ford Motor Company, this is, you know, right outside of Detroit, where I am right now, um, you know, he, he looked at her resume and he looked at her and he said, look, we, we, don't, we don't have any female engineers working here. Because remember, this is the 1960s. And while Ford Motor Company had thousands of engineers on staff, not a single one of them was a woman. And so, you know, she, this, there's this moment where she's, she's incredibly deflated. She picks up her resume, uh, picks up her purse, begins to walk out of the room, and, and then she turns around and she tells him her story of all the sacrifice, of all the struggle, of everything that had to happen in order for her to be in this very room with him, applying for this very job. And it was in that moment that this, you know, middle manager from suburban Michigan decided to take a bet 
on a refugee from the other side of the world. And it was interesting for writing this book because I had a chance to talk to him and I realized how much um, of a hard time he got by taking that bet, by deciding to become an advocate for her. That wasn't an easy decision. Um, looking back on it, obviously it, it, was, it was heroic and, and, and he was very proud of it. But at the time um, it wasn't easy and, and, and he actually put his job on the line. Um, so, you know, a lot of what I think about, especially when it, when it applies to this discussion is like, how do we, how do we make these, these heroic acts scale in some way? Um, how do we make it so that they're not these one-off moments where somebody takes a chance on somebody, but that, 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 that kind of behavior is actually encouraged. I mean, you brought up Isabel Wilkerson's book, um, which I love and, you know, actually harkens back to where the Mithi Hingarani is from, you know, when we talk about caste. And in the book, you know, Wilkerson sort of describes the caste system as very much like a, a physical caste that you would wear after you break your arm. A physical caste is, is meant to sort of keep things in place, to keep your bones in place. And the caste system was exactly that. It was set up to, to keep things in place. And I think that we can see a lot of parallels to that right now in business. Like you say, there's, there's a lot of talk um, out there, but, but little has, there's a lot of evidence though that little has, has changed. I think people are saying the right things, but are they doing the right things? Um, so when you ask about sort of 50 years from now, what do, what do we want to see? You know, a lot of what I want to see is that we actually had some really bold conversations that they are probably along the lines of, of what Silda and, and Tim have talked about. I'm sure Andrew will talk about as well, which is like, how do we redefine how we measure what matters? Not just how we talk about what matters, but how do we measure what really matters? You know, I really, uh, I, I, took a, I took a trip to the kingdom of Bhutan recently. And, you know, you probably all, all know that the Bhutan decided 50 years ago, actually, that they were going to redefine how they measure progress. While GDP was the way that, that, that the overwhelming majority of the world thinks about progress, they decided that that just wasn't going to work for them. And they, they reinvented that into what they call gross national happiness. And gross national happiness does not ignore economics. GDP is an important input into gross national happiness, but it's not everything. It's not the full thing that matters. And the, the hope that I have is that we're gonna end up having a very similar conversation because out of necessity, we need to about the business community and about the way that business works. What is the purpose of business? Because you know, we have been told that, that the, the, the purpose of business is to maximize shareholder value. But if we take sort of this Bhutan perspective of shareholder value, yes, is important, but it's not the only thing. It's one thing. The shareholder is one type of stakeholder, but customers, employees, communities, these are all stakeholders as well. Then can we start to redefine that metric, that thing that really matters, where again, profit is one of those things, but it's not everything. Purpose is, is part of that. Community is part of that. Environment is part of that. And, and that way, the leaders who are in charge of moving that metric aren't doing the right thing because of optics, which we know isn't sustainable. They're doing the right thing because that's what they're, they're assigned to do. That's their job. That's the conversation I'm hoping we can have. You know, that is why we need you in public office. Just listening to you makes me feel that, well, you know, you've done a lot using business as a platform, but you can do more if you are in a place where you can change public policies. So Sunil, that's my, that's the promise you hold and that's my wish for our future, that we see you in a high public office, being able to actualize the vision that you have shared with us and the promise of your mother's legacy, which is really about inclusion. As a woman, as a woman of color, a refugee woman of color, in a, in a STEM area, which is a predominantly male dominated area, she excelled where no woman, no man could. And kudos to her male mentor who took, as you said, a leap of faith. And that's why we need those male allies. My students are studying the leadership of women and the male allies who are advancing women leaders, including men like Timothy and Andrew, 
and David Wilkins, to whom this study is dedicated to. So with those words, Sunil, I think it's a great way to um, have Andrew join this conversation. Andrew is one of our distinguished graduates, a distinguished alumni whom we are very proud of. He's the Global Chief Compliance Officer, the Senior Legal Officer and Senior Managing Director at Cerebiras Capital Management. And he too, like Timothy, is charged with, with advancing ESG. And I think ESG has now become, as you know, Silda pointed out, the measure of success in a successful and sustainable company. So Andrew, can you build on what Timothy and Silda said about ESG, but also taking into account what Sunil spoke about, the importance of really, um, you know, having a vision for the world that is inclusive as well as one that will address some of the iniquities of the past. Because I think Sunil's whole work was, how do we balance the, uh, the, uh, the playing field? How do we make the world more equitable? And ESG is, is one measure of that vision for the future. Andrew? Sure. Well, um, first I'm honored to be on a panel with you guys. Um, excuse me. Um, I enjoy going last sometimes because I'm going to touch on a number of things that you guys talked about, all of which I, I wholeheartedly agree with. Um, just starting where, where we left off um, and, and going ahead 20 years or so, um, I do think that to date we have done, um, we progressed quite a bit. Um, but the only true way to make the change is through changing the culture of an individual firm or an individual company or ensuring that ESG is part of that culture. And so when you introduced me, you said that um, I'm in charge of ESG and I am, I'm the chair of our ESG committee, but not because somebody um, assigned it to me, it's because I took it under my purview because when we decided to formalize our ESG program, um, I thought that ESG really fits in the realm of compliance. And I think it's, um, when we talk about ESG, when we talk about diversity and inclusion or corporate social responsibility, I actually think it's the obligation of the chief compliance officer, somebody similarly situated, to actually lead that effort at a company. And I think that's part of what I've always envisioned my role as the global chief compliance officer as, um, as, as uh, really you know, pushing out the culture, uh, establishing and maintaining the culture of the firm. And I think that's really important um, and shouldn't be lost on anyone. Um, we have had an ESG program. Uh, as I said, it was informal back as, as far back as uh, 2000. Um, and in 2012, I decided to formalize it, come out with a, a policy and then build on that policy, establish a committee, establish reporting that, that um, I think that's a good segue to touch on what, what Silda was talking about. Um, it, reporting and metrics are key to showing where we are, where we were, where we are and where we're going. Because to your question earlier, uh, Rangida, when we look back, we want to show the progress that we've had, whether it's next year, five years from now, or uh, 20 years from now. And one thing that we did along our ESG journey is to constantly change how we view ESG. So it's not just environmental, social, and governance, and you need to expand in each of those areas. But last year, we added um, impact to our program. So we don't call it ESG anymore. We call it ESGI. Mm -hmm. Part of that ESGI was incorporating the positive impact that you can have by virtue of a lot of different you know, mechanisms through your investments, through introspectively you as a firm, um, how you conduct your yourselves, going back to the cultural aspect um, and diversity and inclusion and CSR, corporate social responsibility, is part of that. 
And until you have complete buy-in, um, and that's why I make it a cultural thing, until you have complete buy-in of all the senior people at the firm, um, but not just the senior people at the firm, right? Everybody at the firm, um, that's when you start getting real change. And that's when, and I think we're, we're, we talked about, you know, where are we on the, on the spectrum of ESG, ESGI? And I think we are at a tipping point. I'm actually quite an optimist that we look back 20 years from now, um, we're going to be happy with where we were in, in the things that we we're starting to implement in, uh, in 2020. Um, but going back to metrics, um, we came up with the concept in about 2015 or 16 of what we call an ESG dashboard. So we rank all of, we, we have the advantage, we own the companies. So rather than, um, you know, we can, while they're separate corporate entities, of course, we can, uh, to some degree, we control them so we can impose our, our ESGI um, will on them, if you will. But it's not enough to just get them to do things. We have to get them to want to do those things. So we have to demonstrate that um, looking at ESGI uh, metrics is good for the company, drives value. And by the way, you're not giving up value, right? You can still have great financial returns. In fact, I would argue better financial returns. You have a real robust ESGI program. So just again, going back to reporting, I think it's incredibly important. I, I did not write a book. I feel a little um, behind since two of our panelists, and, and maybe I think Silda might have written a book, certainly could write a book. Um, <laughs> but the one thing that we do that I, um, I guide, and, and while I'm the, the chair of the ESG committee, I am completely dependent on all of my ESG, um, ESGI staff really do the work, but we come up, so I will do a prop. Uh, we come up with an annual report every year. This one is our, the first time we called it ESGI report. And in it, we do show, I won't, I won't bore you by going through um, and showing you the dashboard, but we do rank companies um, on where they are and where they can be, right? So it's not always, it's not, we're, we're I think when we talk about ESG, and diversity and inclusion, we shouldn't just look at where we are because we're all gonna be disappointed. Certainly um, in the financial services industry, it's extremely disappointing to look at diversity. And so I don't like to judge our companies and, and other companies on where we are necessarily, but it's where you hope to be and what you're doing to get there. And so some of our best ESGI stories are really the improvements that we made, right? We're far from perfect. And I'm not sure we can strive for perfection, but I think we need to be realistic about where we are and where we can get to. So um, let me leave you with one, one last comment because I know we can talk literally, I was gonna say for hours, but for days on, on, the, on these topics. Um, I can't remember who it was, so I apologize. I think it was Sonal um, who talked about, you know, different types of stakeholders. And I think traditionally we have looked in corporate America on the shareholder, right? And the board only has a fiduciary duty to maximize the benefit to the shareholder. And I think that's changing in a very positive way because there are other stakeholders like society. Right, and that when you think about positive impact and how to make company better and what as a board, the fiduciary duty is, you have to incorporate more than the traditional model. So Andrew, you brought uh, to the forefront several very important issues and just your two last issues. One that there's a shift from the Milton Friedman's vision of business be the purpose of business as being profit for the shareholder to an understanding that there's a broader ecosystem of stakeholders whom businesses need to be accountable towards. And I think that's, and Andrew, that's very consistent with Sunil, what Sunil just shared with us, that, that understanding there's, there's a shift 
from the shareholder to a stakeholder um, uh, capitalism, which is also now then a new new kind of terminology, compassionate capitalism, purpose-driven capitalism. And so there's a whole new uh, kind of vernacular to address this issue. But you also said that, you know, we need to look at not where we are, but where we want to be. And I think that is important. And towards that goal of where we want to be, I want to share with you again from Timothy's writings, because this goes to what both Silda and Timothy said, McKinsey has found that in 2017, companies in the top quartile of racial and ethnic leadership had a 33% likelihood of outperforming their peers. So that's very promising. However, as Timothy points out, and I pointed out earlier, with the confluence of this perfect storm of COVID and a leadership crisis, which has brought about both, you know, unparalleled economic crisis, as well as a health uh, pandemic, what we might see is the reversal or the rollback of some of those gains. So given that possibility, what are the structural and institutional steps that you are taking, Andrew, and what Timothy is taking, and what Silda is envisioning through her writings and through her leadership uh, on boards? And then I wanted Sunil to look at this, I think, very fundamental point that Timothy always talks of, that, um, that this new vision for ESG looks at the entire ecosystem, including the supply chains, right? And where the supply chains are diverse and inclusive. And Sunil spoke about his mother being an, the first woman the first woman, the first woman of color, the first woman of color refugee engineer at Ford. What a, what a piece of history. When history is written, we will be featuring women like Sunil's mother. But will we have more Rani Hingoranis who will be the engineers of the future, who are the engineers of AI and the internet of things? Because without Rani Hingoranis being the developers, being the visionaries of the new technologies, what we will see is that some of the flaws, some of the biases that, you know, Isabel Wilkerson speaks of so eloquently will be baked into all of those engineering technology and innovation. So how do we use our, you know, the work that you're doing, Timothy, with supply chains to make sure that there are more Rani Hingoranis who are part of that supply chain? So I'm going to now ask you to respond to that, but I'm going to start with Andrew and then go back and then end with Timothy. Andrew? Okay, and I'll be brief, but the, the, the two comments that you made, I think are really important questions that you posed. The first though, to be clear, I don't think it's inconsistent to focus on share maximizing shareholder value and other stakeholders. Like I'm a, I'm a true believer that ESGI drives value um, and it drives both tangible value, meaning you're gonna get a better, what we're, we are largely a private equity shop. So when we buy a company, if we understand the ESGI issues, we remediate any and we improve them, we create a more sustainable footprint, et cetera. We will, we will maximize um, value on monetization with those. We will get better monetization, right? But I don't think you're sacrificing anything. In fact, I think by addressing ESGI issues, including diversity and inclusion, you are actually creating value. I see them as very consistent. Now, We've tried, here's one area of metrics that I think are difficult, is putting an actual value on that, right? So everybody knows that, that if, you keep, if you have low turnover um, in the workforce, that you actually save money. But how much money do you save by having a better culture um, and keeping, retaining people? And those, those kind of metrics, um, I am reluctant to, to um, 
sort of offer them up until I can really back them up, which I think goes to some of the other points about metrics. Um, the second thing is the way not to fall back um, during a COVID uh, situation or other situations is, and it sounds a little trite maybe, but goes back to my point about culture. This is embedded into the DNA and the culture of a firm, um, both positive impact, uh, diversity and inclusion, CSR, all of the things that we've talked about. It's much harder to slide back. In fact, I would argue that one of the reasons why we've done quite well during a work from home remote COVID environment is because we had a real commitment to governance, good corporate governance, to other ESGI precepts. And I think if people understand that, they'll, they'll know that um, it's better and you won't slide back. And it, you'll just sustain the trajectory that we're on as a society. Well, we really hope so. Yes, so certainly. Sunil, <laughs> Sunil, can you respond to my question, but also respond to the to the what I think is such a such a moving and powerful story about your mother being a bedrock of the engineering. Uh, philosophy of Ford. So how can we have more of such women of diversity, women of color and women of brilliance seeing yeah. the future of work? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Andrew's point is really, is really strong, which is that these don't have to necessarily be conflicting values. We don't necessarily need to think about this as, hey, let's do that because even though it's gonna hurt our other values is the right thing to do. I, I think as long as we, we have that sort of thinking in place, we're always gonna be asking people to do pro-con analyses. And ultimately I, I, I feel like we're, we're just not gonna make progress fast enough. But again, if we A, figure out that, hey, these, these don't conflict with each other and B, they might actually roll up into something that's bigger and larger than any one individual metric, then I think we can put ourselves on, on the right path. You know, it was, it was interesting the other day, I don't know if you saw this, but the Lululemon CEO, Calvin McDonald, um, was talking about um, what's happening right now during COVID and all, all of the store closures and, 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 and the reduction in business. And one of the things he said is that um, the environmental risk right now, the environmental risk with the fires in the West, the hurricane in the Gulf, um, he's had way, way more store closures due to environmental risk than even due to COVID. And, and so I, I think that it's it, it, the, when you start to see how things like this impact the bottom line um, for even predictable things, you know, more predictable things than something like COVID, um, you start to realize that these things, again, as, as Andrew mentioned, they're not necessarily in conflict with one another. I think the, um, the, other, the other thing Rangi, that, that I bring up is, is this idea of, of, of trust. Like, do we trust that our leaders are doing things for the right reason. Um, because I think when we can, um, so much happens as a result. You brought up you brought up Backable. And one of the stories I heard um, just recently, I was interviewing um, some of the some of the some of the leaders in the nonprofit space. And one story continued to come up over and over again. And it was a moment that happened in January of 2005. And it was shortly, it was a, just a few weeks after after the tsunami. Um, and what had happened is that Doctors Without Borders at that time was really just kind of an organization that people knew about, but it hadn't really hit its stride. And one of something really remarkable happened in January with Doctors Without Borders, specifically on January 4th. The, the head of Doctors Without Borders was doing a press conference and, you know, um, he was basically giving an update on what was happening in the field, uh, what types of obstacles they were facing, what types of work they still had ahead. And right before he stepped off the stage, he looked at the media and he said, hey, by the way, don't, for those of you who are watching, don't, don't send any more money because we actually have all the money that we need. So if you're thinking about contributing right now to what's happening with the tsunami, I encourage you to, to find another organization to donate to because we actually, we're good. We have everything we need. Um, and it was a really remarkable moment for a couple of reasons, because number one, I mean, how often do you see that happening, right? In, in, any, in any field where somebody whose job it is to raise money 
to go ahead and say, look, I'm not going to take advantage of this moment because I'm, I'm, I'm attached to the bigger purpose here, the bigger purpose of what we're working on. That was remarkable. But the second thing that was remarkable is that from that day on, that was January 4th of 2005, January 5th of 2005, Doctors Without Borders received an unprecedented number of donations, unprecedented. The donations skyrocketed and never really stopped from there because people looked at that kind of behavior and said, well, this is an organization that we can trust, um, we, we believe. And, and so I, I think that um, back to Andrew's point, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, there's not a lot of conflict here. If we look at this from a bigger perspective, I think we can look at these as complementary values. And I think when we start to do that, uh, we'll, we'll put ourselves back on a better path. Absolutely. And I think Larry Fink, uh, Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, I think they are looking at the complementarities of the business purpose being one where the shareholder value is maximized, but in a way that is not exploitative, but in a way that is sustainable, that is inclusive and enduring to all stakeholders. And I think that's a win-win situation. So, you know, thank you for all of you for really creating that framework. You know, all, I think of all of you as the pioneers of ESG in different ways and articulating that in ways that provide us with the tools to take this philosophy forward. So Silda, in your, I want you to think of your next Harvard Business Review article. Mm -hmm. and how you're going to look back on this moment and say what are your proposals to the board on ESG given this moment in history? <laughs> well, what I do think is that I think when, when we are looking back at now, we're going to find that the COVID, uh, the Black Lives Matter, these these things that are happening uh, politically that are kind of, I think a bit destabilizing for us in a country that, that um, I don't think we, we were expecting to feel like there were certain destabilizing risks here that we are potentially facing. Um, I think that what we're gonna find is that it actually reinforces what we're doing and it is gonna make the commitment to considering these, these um, the ESG uh, impact piece of this um, more, again, more central to getting um, the best picture that we can of companies and, and which ones are going to outperform. So I don't see the conflict. I agree with both Sunil and Andrew uh, that, um, that I think the, the conflict is sort of created by having uh, people who have this mindset and education and not being open to uh, learning that there can be an even better model than what we might have been trained for when, when we were back in law school or we were back in, in business school, that they're just there. Um, there is more learning now. I think the whole Black Lives Matter movement has has opened all of our eyes in, in many ways to what we saw as reality being uh, not necessarily a, a full reality. Um, so I feel like this uh, whole ESG piece will not be going backwards, but I hope and believe that it will be moving forward. And I do to go to um, Andrew's reference of measurement because I think measurement is very important and I think being able to um, see how there is added value here is important ultimately. Um, there are a number of studies that have now been able to be done uh, to look at companies and how they perform and the results seem to be pretty consistently showing that those companies that incorporate uh, best practices for ESG uh, do in fact outperform. And, and so to, to your point, Andrew, how do you, how do you prove that something is, is better? There's a, there's a 
in in this uh, article, the last the the article that I've done on uh, sustainability ratings, um, John and I had referred to um, a, a study that Harvard Business School had done, and they found that one dollar invested over mm -hmm. twenty years yielded twenty eight dollars in returns to those companies focused on ESG versus one point four for those without the focus. Uh, and I think those studies are only going to continue. And that might be a great project, Andrew, for you to do within your, your firm, your portfolio, uh, and be able to add to that, that um, kind of wealth of knowledge that is, is accumulating out there. Um, so where I think we ultimately go with this is to go back to the quotation, Rangita, that you said at the first about um, enlightened self-interest. And um, the, I think that the, the trust component, I think we are going to find is that, um, that it can be in our self-interest, not only can be, but is ultimately in our self-interest to look through this broader lens and incorporate these other, other factors in the way that we make business decisions. Because we are not just islands, but we are actually all part of an, an ecosystem. And I do think that that's something I hope we all gain from this particular point in our history, where we're seeing that the financial system is tied up with the health public health system which is tied up with uh, how we we treat um, diverse members of our communities and so i hope that we all end up becoming more enlightened uh and having greater value for us all to share as a result of these these esg considerations thank you silda and if there is a difference in this particular moment in time and this particular social justice movement is that it is for the first time a multiracial movement and it's a global movement. The Black Lives Matter movement now has global resonance. And so there is this sense that the, that the world is coming together in creating a more equal world. And so on that point, since you are the last speaker, I want you to leave us for an inspiring note. When you spoke to my class a couple of weeks ago, when it was the first class that I was teaching for the semester after a tumultuous summer of COVID, isolation, and Black Lives Matter, and the students needed to hear your voice, your voice of inspiration, which really helped to raise their spirit, you are the one who introduced us to Isabel Wilkerson. And I'm going to very quickly um, read something that she writes, which is so powerful. She says, caste, as Sunil mentioned, is the insidious and therefore powerful because it is not hatred. It is not necessarily hatred. It is not necessarily personal. It is those worn grooves of comforting routines and unthinking expectations and patterns of a social order that looks like the natural order of things. So how can we disrupt what we consider this natural order of things and create a new order? of business and which is really what ESG is about, creating a new order of business and a new equal world and a new global order. So, Timothy? Oh, that's so beautiful. And it was great to speak to your students because you saw in the faces of those students that they're gonna carry this forward. We have to understand that when we had talked about, is it Gen Z? They're graduating from college right now. So some of them are already in your law school class, Rangita. Um, so I am really inspired by that, but I wanna even come back further to the beginning of your conversation and saying, how do we meet the SDGs? And we've talked a lot about the emotional, um, thoughtful way that we can do it as passionate leaders. But I think we do have to recognize there's a regulatory framework that still is stuck in that old order. And so I was really, 
um, pleased to hear Andrew talk about how in his own organization, he can start thinking about moving funds and money towards the ESG. Um, in 2005, there's something called, believe it or not, the Freshfields Report, which was the first time that looked and said, hey, if ESG factors are material, you as an investor have to take those into account. Well, we're now 15 years further along, and of course, anything that's material is going to be taken into account. But the question is, how do we move the trillions of dollars of assets that are under management by asset managers, life insurance companies, pension holders? How can that money be moved to create, and Andrew, again, I love your phrase, impact? How can you do social impact? So right now our firm is studying this across 10 jurisdictions and guess which jurisdictions laws are last in helping move that money so that managers can feel their fiduciary duty is being assumed, it's the US. And we've just had some Department of Labor guidance just recently come out again saying, yes, you can think about ESG, but don't forget about modern portfolio theory, and you better be able to back it up. And this is why I come now to Silda's point that thinking about what those metrics are and information, how you can back it up, that you are thinking long term. I mean, I love the head of the Japanese pension fund. He's not even blinking an eye thinking that this is long-term smart investment, and he's the largest asset owner in the world, okay? But the U.S. doesn't have that policy. So thinking now to be a bit more inspirational, thinking, Sunil, I'm so glad you're thinking about government and regulation because we do need to give people space. There are so many asset managers out there right now who want to do the right thing. And I will say, um, looking again at that Google bond for $5.7 billion, do the right thing in investing in racial justice and equality as well. So if we can get a regulatory framework that we can start moving in, in the comfort zone, that's where Rangita, the big funds will be moved such that we're going to move the dial towards those SDG goals. Otherwise, some of us are gonna be playing around the edges and in my opinion, it's just gonna to take too long. We don't have that much time. We've got to move faster. So we need good traction of data that can support those companies and leaders, as you keep emphasizing, Rangita, who are going to have the courage and boldness to make those decisions um, and that they won't get sued by their shareholders or others. So that's the lawyer's take of it. Hopefully that's still somewhat inspirational and in leaving us on a good note, Rangita. I love that, Timothy, and that's why I wanted to close with you, because you echo what the Secretary General told the General Assembly of 193 leaders of nations who are now, you know, <laughs> who are charged with the, the safekeeping, you know, mm. hitherto we would call it peacekeeping, and now it's the safekeeping of their people. And he's told them it is time to ratchet up the ambition and highlight the imperatives of inclusion and sustainability. So if there was ever a time to ratchet up the ambition, that audacity of thinking and the boldness of thinking that you you just spoke about and what Andrew and Silda and Sunil spoke about, the importance of sustainability has never been more important than now. And just to go back to our first call to action, which Silda echoed, what the Secretary General says about this being something that needs to be assumed by all business leaders with enlightened self-interest by the business community, all the sustainable development goals would be just a nice exercise in diplomatic discussions in New York, but the impact on people, the impact on the planet will be very small. So in 20 years time, when we look back, I want to make sure that even this rather modest discussion is not just a nice exercise in diplomatic discussion, but that will have impact on the planet and on the well-being of all people. So thank you so much for really being part of that clarion call to action. 
or as what Greta Thunberg told the World Economic Forum, the future of humankind rests firmly in your hands. Thank you, Timothy. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Silda. And thank you, Sunil, for what you're doing. Thank you, Rangita.